Hi, I'm Dr. David Berger. Welcome to Your Health, Your Choice, a series that is dedicated to health, education, and medical choice. Today, I'm going to be introducing myself more to you, and I think there's no better way of doing this than to be interviewed by our executive producer of the show, who happens to be my sister, Shari Kulani. So Shari, welcome to the show. Hi, David. I'm so glad to be in front of the screen and having the opportunity today to introduce you to the world and to share with those who already know you more about how you came to be the person you are. So I'd like to start today by speaking a little bit about your upbringing in South Florida and some of the early influences in your life. Yes, as are you, as a matter of fact. Yes, I was born in Hollywood, Florida, um, back at 1969, so pushing past 50 years now. Um, one of the few people our age who actually, that we can say that we were actually born in Florida, that we are true Florida natives. Um, and yes, yeah, so from the very beginning, we had a really strong upbringing in, in education, and I had the amazing opportunity of having South Florida is one of their very first pediatricians to make it to South Florida, Dr. Arnold Tanis, who really became one of my very first mentors and guiding lights and really was the one who kind of pushed me along all, all of these years. Supposedly, when I was five years old, I told him I was going to be a pediatrician just like, just like he was, and we kind of held to that track all the way through. Well, I know that Dr. Tanis had a really big influence on both of us, and that he also influenced the way that you practice medicine. Um, when I was a kid, Dr. Tanis had this amazing ability to conduct a full exam without me having realized that he had done anything. I thought I was just hanging out with Dr. Tanis at his office. I didn't realize that anything had happened. And I know that that had a really big impact on you and how you then came to approach medicine. For example, I know one of the things that you decided very early on was that you would take that to the next step and not wear lab coats in the office, for example, because you wanted to have a certain demeanor with your pediatric patients. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship that you try to develop and the environment that you try to create for your patients. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Dr. Tanis was a member of the family. You know, he was like our godfather. Um, we adored, we loved going to the doctor, which not everybody liked to get done. And and it was just such a positive influence. And, you know, thankfully, as I kind of got into high school and I was able to start shadowing him in the, in the office, I was able to start following him around the hospital when he would do his newborn rounds. And if there were any sick kids there, he then was very instrumental in helping me get into medical school. And I was actually accepted into a, an accelerated medical program where I, I got into medical school out of high school. And with that, I attended Lehigh University that was in a combined program with the Medical College of Pennsylvania. And so it was very nice to know that out of high school that I was already in medical school and I had some minimal requirements, but unlike most pre-med students, I was able to enjoy college probably a little bit more than most because of that, which is, which is pretty neat. But as far as Dr. Tanis goes, it was just that, you know, and it wasn't just for us because in speaking with other people, he was like that for everybody. And that was something that I really, really appreciated. And so, you know, with, with the patients in my practice and all along, I've always looked at them as my nieces and my nephews, as my godchildren, and and to be invested in them and invested in their lives. And, you know, whenever we get, to, whenever I have an appointment, I'm, I'm always first like, hey, what's going on? You guys go on any vacations? What's fun in your life? What's going on? Any life events? Because I feel that's so much, one of the things that's missing in mainstream medicine, in, in industrial medicine, is that personal touch. You know, very rarely do people actually get to see their same doctor all the time these days. They're in these very large groups. And that's kind of the antithesis of, of the way I really wanted to develop it. We we created our office to look like you were coming into my home with a waiting room that looks like a living room. You'll, you We don't wear white coats. We, um, I, I, I use our couch as an exam table. We don't even, I, we have a procedure table in another room, but you come in and you're hanging out with me and I'm able to educate and, and work with people on such a level. And if a kid's wanting to have a, a fit on the floor, the kid has a fit on the floor. If the kid decides to climb on the tables and climb on the chairs, the kid climbs on the tables and chairs because we want them to be comfortable and feel like they're at a home because we know that that's part of that relationship. And that when it comes time for me to examine a child, that they just kind of, as Sherry, as you said, that 
it's it's almost like it's happening. In fact, when I when I teach my students who come, I, I'm on the faculty at University of South Florida in the College of Nursing, and so we have nurse practitioner students who rotate through our office. And one of the things I'll even sh sh tell them when when I'm examining a, ch a children, watch what I'm doing with my elbows, with my forearms. Just note the art of the examination, not just the science of what we're doing, because to get a young child, a toddler, a special needs child to actually sit there and be quiet enough or still enough in order to do a proper physical exam or how to manipulate my elbows and my arms in such a way that I can actually get in to look in someone's ear, listen to the heart, feel their belly. Um, and they're totally comfortable in what, the, in what I'm doing with them. They, they, they don't even realize again what I'm doing. And the students afterwards are like, oh, well, that's how you examine a child. And so that that's all part of the comfort level. And then, of course, as you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years now. And so now I have patients who are teenagers and the, to have that type of relationship with them now that, you know, that they can come to me as an adult that they know and that they trust, that they've gotten good advice from. And, you know, some of the things that I've heard from that teens have have divulged to me through the years. I mean, it's sometimes the that are shocking because that would be expected with with teenagers but at the same time they they know me and they know that i'm going to give them a fair shake they know i'm not going to judge them and that's all part of the relationship that i want to have with them and now i'm actually starting to have patients who have kids of their own now in the second generation and it's just that circle of life that comes around and that they want me to be their kids pediatrician because they had such a a positive interaction with me to start off with and that's probably the most grateful thing I am into this job is those relationships that I have with people and the mutual trust that we're able to develop. I know from working with you in your pediatric office that hugging is something that is very welcome, right? Uh, you're kind of known as a, as a big teddy bear. And I reflect back to Dr. Tannis on that as well. I remember that one of the things I used to love about going to Dr. Tannis's office was, man, I got a really big bear hug from Dr. Tannis. And it's interesting, we'll talk a little bit later about as a pediatrician, how you evolved into treating adults, which is something you also do. And I reflect back on when I was going to college and having sort of a final exam, so to speak, with Dr. Tannis to get my paperwork in order for college. And he had said to me, he said, you know, you're getting to the age where it might be time for you to get a big people's doctor. And I remember kind of giggling because I was 18 years old and saying big people's doctor just seemed, you know, like he was still talking to me as a little kid, but I got it. But there was a part of me that wished that wasn't having to be the case. I wished I would have been able to continue to work with him. So we'll, we'll circle back around to that later and some of the work that you do with adults as well. You mentioned you attending Lehigh for undergraduate, which was part of a six-year medical program with the Medical College of Pennsylvania uh, outside of Philadelphia. Now you, instead of doing it as a six-year med program, decided even before you started college that you were going to turn that into a seven-year program. And I'm wondering if you could share with us why you made that decision. Yeah, certainly. I didn't feel the need to rush into it all. Um, I didn't feel that the six-year program was like taking 18 to 21 credits each semester. Each uh, semester, um, It required going over the summertime. And I didn't feel that there was, if I was going to go to college, I wanted to be enjoying the college life experience as much as I can. And I knew my professional life was going to be there. And I was able to come home for summers and, and take it a little easier. And you know, I'm I'm kind of a chill guy in the first place, and so I'm 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 I try to keep the stress minimal in my life as much as I can, being a physician, of course. But just to have those types of more more freedom to be able to enjoy, and one of the beautiful things about the program itself, one of the things about Medical College of Pennsylvania is that it was actually Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, which is the first medical college for women in the United States. And it was actually all women until 1970, and my class was the first that was 50% guys. The administration, most of the teachers, faculty were women, and we were really taught a more humanistic approach than friends of mine who went to University of Miami, University of Florida, and elsewhere. In fact, we had the opportunity in college, we were told, don't worry so much about your grade, get a well-rounded education, take art classes, take foreign language classes, take philosophy classes, things that would not be typically part of a pre-med curriculum. We even have the opportunity of having a, a master's of arts and take art classes and history of medicine and women in medicine as part of a medical school curriculum too. So I really felt that that womanly touch 
was so much a part of our original um, upbringing that I think was another thing that transferred me into seeing the relationship that we had with Dr. Tannis and then also seeing how you can apply this to humanity. And, and that was a really special thing that, that I don't think you would have happened at any other university. So I, I was very fortunate because that really helped me in my person from my personality and who I am to feel comfort with the type of, of field that I was going into. So I know that as, by doing it in a seven year program, like you said, you were able to take different types of courses. I remember the only time I remember since you were five years old and I was three that you even questioned whether you were wanting to be a pediatrician is when you took an undergraduate class in journalism and declared, oh, maybe I should do sports journalism. It was like this moment of you having like a thought of like one other thing that you thought you could really love. And then you realized you were still going to be a doctor. <laughs> um, but I was wondering well, if you yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's actually even one step further funny that because I, I made that announcement to our parents um, at, at, at parents weekend. And I honor my parents so much for not completely losing their mind at that point. Here I was accepted into medical school. We had this whole thing and I'm like, yeah, may maybe I'm not going to do that. And I know internally I found afterwards that it kind of blew up on them, but they, they did a great job keeping it together and supporting me and 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 making me feel like it was important for me to make the decisions on, on my own. And, and I really honored them for doing that because I could imagine that might not have gone so well and it went as well as it could. And they gave me the latitude and the freedom to kind of assess again what was really important and what I wanted to pursue in life. And, you know, fortunately, I, I, I came back around after that after that half a semester and said, nah, I think being a doctor would be a really good idea. Being a pediatrician would be a really good idea. So yeah, <laughs> thank you, mom and dad for that. So when you're wrapping up your time at Medical College of Pennsylvania, you had one of the biggest decisions that is before any future pediatrician, which is where are you going to do your residency? And I know that you had a lot of options before you and you ultimately selected to go to the University of South Florida's Tampa General Hospital. And I'm wondering if you could tell us why. Yeah, so when we graduate medical school during our last year, we all visit different residency programs and we rank them based upon our order of preference. And the residency programs also rank us based upon their order of preference. And I had, I, I you know, had a, a, a interviews at uh, at Harvard and at Stanford and at University of South uh, University of California San, uh, San Francisco and Emory and. I really fell in love with Tampa General. It was a smaller program. Um, it's in a dramatic setting right on the um, on the end of an island that's overlooking Tampa Bay. You take a bridge driving in. The, the pediatric department was actually on the top floor overlooking these huge bay windows overlooking with the sun setting behind it. And it was just a really warm, comfortable feeling. It didn't feel so mechanical. It didn't feel um, so intellectual that it, that it was the type of thing that just kind of felt very comfortable to me. And when I went for the interview and we went to lunch with the different residents, we didn't talk all about science and, and health. We talked about sports and we talked about music and we talked about the things that we enjoy doing. And of course we talked some about health and science as well. And the thing that really grabbed me was two things. Number one is that they had two days of outpatient clinic per week. Whereas most of the centers of the of the other residencies had one. And I knew I was going to be an outpatient pediatrician. And so I felt it would give me twice the amount of experience that the other programs. The second thing is that because it was a smaller program, it did not have a lot of our fellows. So once a person finishes their residency, if they want to be, a, say, a pediatric cardiologist or a pediatric pulmonologist, they then go into do additional training, which is a fellowship. In most of our big programs, the fellows ran the show. But without having fellows, we got to run the show as residents. I got to run the ICU. I got to run the emergency room. All that experience, all those cool cases, being involved in surgeries um, and deliveries, I wouldn't have had that level of experience if there were so many people above me. So I really felt that I got just so much more hands-on experience than I would have pretty much anywhere else. And I really appreciate that about the program. I know that one of the things you've shared with me over the years is the the specific type of clinical experience that you got. And one of the other mentors that you met later in life um, through the University of South Florida, uh, the residency program being at Tampa General Hospital, and that was Dr. Barnes. 
I'm wondering if you could introduce who Dr. Barnes is and how he became such a big influence on how you developed your medic your medical philosophy. Yeah. So Dr. Lou Barnes is probably considered the the grandfather, great grandfather of modern pediatric medicine. Um, he was at Hopkins before that. He actually trained Frank Oski, who became both the president of the Academy of Pediatrics and literally wrote the textbook. The, uh, there were two pediatric textbooks that we could have used, the Oski textbook and the Nelson textbook. And, and so his, his initial mentor actually wrote the book. But Dr. Barnes was all about nutrition and breastfeeding. He was really one of the first breastfeeding advocates in the nation from a, from, a, from a pediatrician. And he would come into our clinics every time and tell us, don't use this medicine, don't use this medicine, learn about B vitamins, learn about breastfeeding, let the body heal itself. And there were times where if, if we chose not to write a prescription for an antibiotic for somebody, and this is true with the entire program, we were lauded. We were, we, they were proud of us for not just throwing medicines at people, but actually assessing a situation was, ah, you have a virus, maybe you need some IV fluids to kind of catch you up a little bit. Maybe, you know, maybe you're having some breathing problems so we can take care of that, but it doesn't look like it's a bacteria and, and don't use antibiotics. And that was one of the earliest, earliest ways that I kind of started to see things from a bigger and a more natural perspective is because he kind of gave us the latitude and then the program did of not just throwing medications at everybody left and right. And and I just remember so distinctly him coming in and talking about methylmalonic acidemia, which has to do with B vitamin metabolism, which is something that I'm, I use on a regular basis now. And, you know, back in medical school, we were taught biochemistry in a way of follow the bouncing carbon. There's There's all these chemical reactions. This turns into this, this turns into that. They never taught us how to apply it. Dr. Barnes was really the person who first taught me how to start applying B vitamin metabolism to health. And, and, then, and then fortunately, right around that time during my second year, an article came out in, our, in a, our, a journal that we all subscribe to called Contemporary Pediatrics. It was the trade journal for the Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Barnes happened to be the, the editor emeritus of this, of this journal. He was like the founder of this journal. And this article was called Seven Herbs Every Pediatrician Should Know About. And it was written by Dr. Kathy Kemper, who went on to write a book called The Holistic Pediatrician. And she then moved on to Harvard to create the first holistic pediatric subset. She then, I believe, did it down at Baylor and I think now at Ohio State. And so she would just go every few years to another to start a holistic pediatric program. And so I said to the department, Dr. Barnes, to uh, um, um, Dr. Ringenberg, Dr. Frias, who are our residency director and and the, to the the chair of the department, can I start using these herbs in the clinic? It's in contemporary pediatrics, and and they were like, hey, that's our home journal. Anything that's in contemporary pediatrics is completely fair game. It's totally cool for you to do that. So I started using herbs in the clinic during my second year, and with success. And all of a sudden the community started hearing about it. And here was this resident who's actually using herbs and taking natural approaches to medicine. I know that um, some of the philosophies you've talked about that Dr. Barnas and other people brought to you. There's another aspect of your experience as a resident that I know had a really big impact on you. And that was your getting into the Tampa community. And part of that involved also um, becoming part of the Skipper's music community and meeting people that were in other forms of alternative medicine through the midwifery community and other, and other aspects of the broader Tampa community. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how that experience also helped form your core philosophy of how you started to envision how medicine can best be served with patients. Yeah. And so you know, even coming back to college, you know, growing up in South Florida, we were pretty limited with what our music experiences was. And, you know, I, I did thankfully find the Grateful Dead when I got to college. And when I when we got to my residency at Tampa General, um, there's this wonderful um, Key West style place um, called Skipper's Smokehouse, where every Thursday night they had Grateful Dead night. And it was the one day a week where I was able to kind of escape the rest of my life, even to the point where if I was supposed to be on call on the Thursday night, I would take call for somebody on their Friday night, so just so I had Skippers as my retreat for that once a once a week to get to get away. And and you know, being involved in the music community, in the Grateful Dead community, I really also think opened my mind in a way to other populations. 
and other ways of seeing things from a more worldly um, perspective. And and that was a really helpful thing. And, you know, fortunately, I was, as one of the experiences that I had, I had worked a lot with the AIDS population, the pediatric AIDS population. And um, I was very involved in the clinic at Tampa General. And they asked me if I would be the first camp doctor for Camp Wanago, which was a camp for children with HIV or if their family members were HIV um, positive. And it really started off because there was this girl who had AIDS and who wanted to go to camp and none of the camps would let her in simply because she had AIDS. And she kept saying, but I wanna go, I wanna go. and so. So the Tampa AIDS Network came up with a camp called Camp Wanago in her honor. Unfortunately, she didn't survive to make it to actually the first day of camp, but the camp was named it was named in honor of her. And so when I it was such an amazing experience to be able to go to camp with all of these kids. I knew some of them through the through the clinic already, some through the community. And you know, the first night at camp, which was just a wonderful experience, these were kids underprivileged probably none of them ever went to camp before. And at the end of the first day, I was like, that was awesome, but we're missing something. There's no camp songs, there's no music. And so the camp, which was out in Brandon, I, I drove back into, into South Tampa to get my guitar that first night. And that night I wrote the song, Camp Wanna Go, um, talking about camp, the camp nurse and my role and the counselors and the kids and the food we eat, it's much too sweet. And, um, but also just the love that we had at Camp Wanna Go. So the next day, I wrote, I played the song for some of the of the counselors and the campers, and they were like, "Teach it to us. Let's all do this together." And and then a, a, one of the kids says, "Well, teach us some of your other songs." So I played some of my other original songs, and another kid said, "Well, we should make an album." And one of the counselors says, you know what, we can totally do that. I have a friend who has a studio and we ended up making an album um, of six songs. We, we made a, a thousand CDs, a thousand tapes back in the days when we had cassette tapes. And we actually and we did some concerts around town and between the, um, the donations to the concerts, the purchasing of the CDs and the tapes, we were able to fund the entire second year of camp just from that, from doing that. And the Tampa AIDS Network had um, Art for Life as their big event of the year. And we played this and that was, I remember that Sunday morning and I knew that they had done an article and I go down to get the newspaper and there I am on the front page of the Tampa Tribune there, you know, with 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 one of the kids and us performing on, on this stage. And it was just like another one of those experiences. We actually brought the kids into the studio and they sang backup on the songs for us. And, you know, Shari, you were you were a, one of our performers playing mandolin on it. And uh, it was just an amazing experience. It's like another one of those life experiences that most doctors don't get to have. And it was just, you know, it was such a, an incredibly special experience. And I'm so happy I had that. Thank you so much for joining us on part one of this three-part series of Your Health, Your Choice, where we get to know Dr. David. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel and join us on social media. And we look forward to seeing you for part two.